I am concerned that the Jedi have elected this child to lead the group. I've sat with her many times, and I trust her, Captain. Little skinny, isn't she? <gasps> I feel more like myself than I ever have. He asked me to give you a message. He said, if you don't join him, he will kill me. <laughs> Welcome back to part two of The Complete Life of Ahsoka Tano. In part one, we saw how she was nearly kidnapped by youngling hunters before she could even make it into the Jedi Order, how and why she was paired with the greatest and most reckless of Jedi generals, and how the Clone Wars raised her to be creative and independent. We also saw the first signs of doubt, as Ahsoka is exposed to different points of view and realizes that the war and the people involved could not be seen as simply as good or evil, and the remainder of the Clone Wars would only make her views on the Jedi's role in the galaxy even more complicated. While there was a growing call for peace in the Republic Senate and Separatist Parliament, Dooku orchestrated an attack on the heart of Coruscant. The blast would go off during the vote to open up peace talks, but with the capital plunged in darkness, the Senators were more bloodthirsty than ever. But the first mission after this incident would not be a major Clone Wars battle. It may not even have taken place in this universe. Obi, Annie, and Ahsoka were sent to investigate a Jedi distress code that was over 2,000 years old, which was coming from outside their galaxy. Things get very weird very quickly. Something's wrong. We're at the exact coordinates where the distress signal originated, but there's nothing here. Rex is at the exact same coordinates, and he's not here. And then they notice an enormous double pyramid structure that pulls the shuttle into its blinding light. When the Jedi awake, they are on a lush world, but Kenobi notes that none of their equipment is giving them a location in known space. In fact, they may not even be in the same plane of existence. When they get out of the shuttle, Ahsoka spots a reflection on a distant hill, but no one else sees it. Anakin begins to hear voices that are in his mind only, and an angelic being known as the Daughter emerges. Everyone can see her, and she immediately starts asking if Anakin is the One. Without introduction or explanation, she says she needs to take Anakin to him. Utterly lost and confused, they have no other option than to follow her. As they travel, they notice that the seasons change throughout the day, that there are no animals, and that the Force is incredibly strong and unique here. As they travel a tight mountain pass, the daughter's brother, known as the Sun, causes an avalanche that separates Anakin from them. Obi-Wan and Ahsoka are forced to return to their crash site, but their ship is no longer there. The sky goes dark, the plants die, and the Sun appears. His opening question is an alarming one. Is it true that he is the Chosen One? What do you know of such things? Kenobi knows that no one outside of the High Council should know of this prophecy, especially the fact that Anakin was believed to be the one to fulfill it. Their lightsabers are activated, thinking this could only be a Sith. He laughs this off, saying in a way that was true, but not quite accurate, before transforming into a terrifying bat-like creature and flying off. What in the universe was that? Meanwhile, Anakin has made his way to an enormous castle structure, running up to a being seated upon a great throne. The father bombards the Chosen One with riddles, before pointing out that there is no rush. The Jedi are stuck here. You will be my guest tonight. Obi and Ahsoka were held up in a cave for the night, but sleep is not coming easy. Ahsoka seems troubled by something, and then Obi-Wan hears a voice that he had not heard for a long time. Obi-Wan, have you done as I asked? Have you trained the boy? Kenobi is skeptical that this is actually his master. It is more likely a Sith trick, and continues the conversation with his lightsaber activated. But as the spirit speaks to him, Obi-Wan can sense in the Force that it really was his late friend. Qui-Gon Jinn asked about Skywalker, and explained that this world was a nexus in the Force, one that could prove if the slave boy he had found on Tatooine was truly the Chosen One. Back in the castle, Anakin is not sleeping well either, eventually being woken up by his mother, who pleads with him to let go of his guilt. But he is skeptical too. What kind of black arts is this? When the conversation turns to Padme, the being gets angered, saying that Padme was not his fate, and when Anakin challenges the being on this, his mother flashes into the form of a beast before disappearing. Now Ahsoka would be visited. Are you happy, child? I am your future, your potential. The form of her future self would appear, but likewise, she too believes it is a trick. This being is brutally honest about how Skywalker is planting the seeds of the dark side in her, and how other masters are shocked to see Ahsoka use fear and torture to get answers. This future Ahsoka says that slowly and in small ways, her master is leading her toward the dark side. Be warned. You may never see your future if you remain his student. Leave this planet! 
Skywalker had rushed to the father, activate his saber, and accuse him of being a Sith Lord. You have a very simple view of the universe. I am neither Sith nor Jedi. I am much more. And so are you. The father explains that they are not in the same plane of existence as the rest of the galaxy, that he and his children are the most powerful force wielders known, and that ages ago he knew that they would need to remove themselves from the regular physical universe. You cannot imagine what pain it is to have such love for your children and realize that they could tear the very fabric of our universe. But he also believes that the galaxy he left behind was finding itself in imbalance, that having too much light or dark destroys life as we know it, and that if Anakin was the chosen one, if that old myth was true, he had to find out for himself. The next day, the son and daughter are sent to capture Ahsoka and Obi-Wan. With both in his possession, the father poses an ultimatum to Anakin. He is forced to make a choice, save his Padawan or save his beloved master, framing it as if these are the only two options, a false dichotomy that reflects the imbalance placed on the real world by the Jedi, sorting users as either Jedi or Sith. Anakin seems to have a moment of hesitation until Kenobi says that the planet is the Force, to use its power. Anakin sees that his master is saying he doesn't have to deal in absolutes. He calls upon the wellspring of the Force and pulls both the daughter and son to the ground freeing both Padawan and Master. But he doesn't stop here. He continues to control these beings, forcing them back into their humanoid forms, making them kneel before him, powerless to deny Anakin's strength in the Force. The father declares that this test proves that Skywalker is indeed the Chosen One, the one to keep the balance between these two opposite yet necessary expressions of the Force. But the father then asks to be alone with Anakin. Do not trust him. The father says that Skywalker must take up his place on the throne of balance, outside of space and time, to become the ruler of the Force itself, on the planet that was the wellspring of the cosmic Force. But Anakin turns this down, despite the father's claims that this decision will haunt him and the rest of the galaxy. As they are attempting to leave, Anakin has a nightmare where the sun visits him and tempts him to the dark side. When he awakens, he sees the Dark One has snuck aboard the ship and leaps out of the bay door holding Ahsoka. In the beast form, the son has the Padawan in his claws, and despite the fast and expert piloting by Anakin, the monster escapes, and the shuttle makes a hard crash landing. Kenobi says they should hold off rescuing Ahsoka and seek out the father, but Anakin refuses and walks towards the tower. When Ahsoka awakens, she is in a prison cell and is visited by an odd little creature, which doubts that her master will ever come for her. He will come for me. And if he does not? He will! After he frees her, the odd creature bites into her arm, and the Padawan falls to the ground seeming to wither and become visibly darker. She is being consumed by the dark side of the Force, the process completed when her eyes turn yellow. Back with the father, Kenobi would be granted the Blade of Mortis, a weapon that would be able to control the sun. But in the courtyard of the Dark Spire, Ahsoka confronts her master. Are you proud of me, master? Always with the criticism, master never really believing in me. The dark side is flowing through her, playing on her insecurities and turning her frustrations with Anakin into pure hatred. She will not allow her master to talk her out of it, saying the son has a plan for them both. I feel more like myself than I ever have. He asked me to give you a message. He said, if you don't join him, he will kill me. <laughs> This would erupt into full combat, Skywalker trying to disarm her while Ahsoka was giving it everything she had. And now, the student will kill the master. You're getting ahead of yourself, aren't you, Snips? Don't call me that! I hate it when you call me that! Skywalker was able to hold her off, and when Kenobi arrived, the Padawan was more easily held at bay. Meanwhile, inside the Dark Spire, the fight between the son and the daughter would mirror the struggle between the Jedi. But as Obi-Wan threw the Mortis Blade to Anakin, Ahsoka intercepts it and delivers it to her new master. Once the son had the only weapon that could kill the father, he turns to his dark disciple and coldly presses his finger against Ahsoka's forehead, ending her life. The Padawan falls dead to the floor, her lightsaber is rolling out of her limp hands. As the son goes to kill the father, the daughter rushes in between them and takes the strike. Mortally wounded, she falls to the floor beside Ahsoka. Both the son and father are devastated by her loss. But the father who symbolized the balance of the Force also knows this will have grave consequences for the galaxy at large. All is lost. The balance has been broken. 
Anakin is focused on Ahsoka, frantically trying to find a way to save his Padawan, but the father says there is nothing he can do. There is no hope. Yes, there is. There's always hope! Just then, the daughter signals to the father that she wishes the last of her life to be breathed into Ahsoka. The father has Anakin raise one hand over the daughter and one over Ahsoka, and channels through the Chosen One, the last of the daughter's life force, to Ahsoka. With this force transfer from the being that was the very embodiment of the light side of the force, Ahsoka would rise. Hey, Snips. What's going on? The father commands them to leave, but the son will now seek to use their ship to re-enter the physical plane and plunge the galaxy into darkness. The ship was still in rough shape after the crash landing, and Ahsoka assesses everything that needs to be repaired. Well, you want the bad news, or the really bad news? There is a long list of repairs, but with the spare parts on board and some creative shortcuts, she should be able to fix it. The Padawan being tasked with this really highlights Ahsoka's incredible mastery of various ship mechanics, and is just the latest instance in which higher ranking and older Jedi defer to her expertise. As the ship was being repaired, Qui-Gon reappears, but this time to Anakin, telling him to go to a point strong in the dark side of the Force. Sending into a cavern surrounded by pools of lava, the sun shows him the possible futures if Skywalker were to continue down his current path, that the Chosen One must embrace the dark side if he is to bring about peace. When Kenobi arrives, the sun attacks, and with all he has seen in this vision, Anakin tells his master that he knows what has to be done to end the Clone War. That it is the Jedi who will stand in the way of peace. Having sent his master's speeder into the lava, he abandons Obi-Wan and races back to the shuttle with hopes of leading the sun into the galaxy. The Chosen One and the sun, this font of dark side energy, will destroy the Jedi Order and end the war. You have to disable the ship. But I just finished putting it back together. Luckily the Padawan was able to remove a crucial part just before her master returned. And as the son goes to the daughter's tomb to remove the Blade of Mortis, the father speaks with Anakin and learns that the future has been revealed to him. But this cannot be allowed. If there is to be balance, what you have seen must be forgotten. A touch to the forehead and Anakin is stripped of these visions of the future. Once Anakin comes to, the father explains that his son broke a fundamental law of the Force. My son broke the laws of time and showed you what you should never have seen. Just then Ahsoka would come flying in with Kenobi, and together they would face off against the son. While the son begins to think the plan is to kill him, the father would pull the dagger into his hands and take his own life. The son was devastated and is told that their powers are tied together. With his strength fading, Anakin is able to kill the son ending this entire saga in a way that gave the father comfort in his final moments, knowing that Anakin was indeed the Chosen One. The Chosen One? You have brought balance. Stay on this path, and you will do it again. As the monastery complex comes crashing down, a blinding wave of light envelops the Jedi. Ahsoka, Obi, and Anakin wake up to the voice of Rex hailing them from their comms. We were worried. You were off the scopes there for a moment. A moment? To those in the regular plane of existence, the Jedi's absence was only for a few minutes. But this event would remain as one of the most confusing and important events of their lives. Even when it seemed that Anakin was lost to the dark side, as he had said when bringing Ahsoka back to life, there was always hope. No matter how far it seemed her master had fallen, she too was certain that he was the Chosen One, the one destined to bring balance to the Force. But from this metaphysical adventure into the cosmic force itself, the trio would be back on the warfront. Master Even Peel was captured and taken to the Citadel, the most impenetrable facility in the entire galaxy, a prison created by the Jedi centuries ago to hold rogue Jedi. This mission was considered incredibly dangerous and was only being undertaken because the information Peel possessed could lead the CIS to take control of vital hyperspace lanes. Lanes that would act like a superhighway straight to Coruscant and could bring a swift victory for the CIS. I'm sorry I'm late. I just heard about the briefing. Despite the mission's great importance, Anakin has to break the news that Ahsoka will not be coming. She has certainly proven herself, but to Skywalker this was far too risky. A decision that may have been influenced by Anakin having just watched Ahsoka die on Mortis. He knew he was lucky to still have her, and knew he couldn't go through that again. That's not fair! How am I supposed to learn if you won't let me share the risk? Frustrated, Ahsoka turns to the Jedi that discovered her on Shili as a child, her friend and mentor Plo Koon. What is it, little Soka? She reveals that Anakin is being too controlling. 
It's not for him to decide when and how I should put my life in danger. That should be my choice. And though Plo tells her that she needs to respect her master's judgment, he finds a way to help little Soka. The plan would be to have the crew frozen in carbonite, and R2 would command a group of reprogrammed B1 droids to pilot a CIS shuttle. With the scan showing no life forms on board, they were able to make it onto the surface of Lola Seiyu. Once the droids melted everyone out of their carbonite shells, Anakin sees that Ahsoka had disobeyed his orders. Discussed it with Master Plo. If there's one thing I've learned from you, Master, it's that following direct orders isn't always the best way to solve a problem. And again, Kenobi enjoys seeing that Anakin got a taste of his own medicine. As they near the main tower of the Citadel, they notice that the security measures will force them to free climb the rock wall. The climb would be perilous, but when they finally make it, they see that the door is ray shielded something that was not expected or in the original plans. Ahsoka notices that there is a ventilation shaft above the door, and though not considered in the original planning, which she was not a part of, she could fit through it. All seemed clear until Clone Trooper Charger lost his footing and fell into a defense mine, alerting the entire base. Droid guards were scrambled, while the hallways were lined with automated laser turrets and a sweeping pulse of electricity. But as even Peel was about to lose his one good eye to a torture droid, Republic forces come in blasting, freeing the Master and making their way to Captain Tarkin. Sprinting through the hallways, they would be intercepted by customized commando droids, one of which was able to tackle Ahsoka to the ground and start strangling her, before she was able to slice its head off. Watching the Republic tear through his droid forces, the Warden Osi Sobek activates an electromagnet. Magnet rips everyone's weapons out of their hands, and pulls Anakin's arm, along with the rest of him, up to the ceiling. Luckily, he was able to activate his blade, destroying the magnet, and allowing the Republic forces to press through the commandos and free Tarkin. The captain debates with General Kenobi, but the Jedi dismisses his protests and agree to split up their forces to escape the Citadel. A stronger force would have a better chance of protecting the information. Not in this situation. Skywalker would cut through a wall and out into the old fortress tunnels created back when the Jedi once ruled this facility. Ahsoka scouts ahead and reports all is clear, while Tarkin then argues with Anakin and even later tries to get Rex to agree that this was madness to follow the orders of a Padawan. I am concerned that the Jedi have elected this child to lead the group. I've sat with her many times, and I trust her, Captain. Kenobi and Peel's group end up getting captured, but Ahsoka's improvising helped to take out the shield-wielding commandos while still having enough explosives to blow through a hole in a tunnel wall. She would then lead the way through a fuel pipeline, but reports that R2 and the shuttle are not at the extraction point. The Warden detected this second team as well, and more droid forces swarmed them. But Skywalker is able to clear the clankers this time. R2 would have to improvise, getting the B1s to act as if they were escorting the Republic prisoners, guiding Kenobi's group to the intended extraction point on a landing pad. It almost worked without a hitch, but the tactical droid was able to inform his units that these B1s were reprogrammed imposters. An intense firefight breaks out on the landing pad, with speeder bikes hijacked midair, turbo laser cannons blasting away, and commando droids showing why they were one of the most intelligent droid variants in the CIS turning the guns on the shuttle and taking out Echo along with it. With no other option, Kenobi and Skywalker make the call to the temple, saying they had to scrap the plan and needed immediate backup. Plo Koon replies that they will send a fleet immediately. As they progress through the cavernous terrain, Ahsoka's surprised to hear Anakin sympathize with Tarkin's critiques of the Jedi, especially where they fell short when it came to running a war. Captain Tarkin feels the Jedi should be relieved from the burden of leading the war effort. That's ridiculous. But we aren't soldiers. We're peacekeepers. The Jedi Code often prevents us from going far enough to achieve victory. Rex would now lead the way through the winding cave systems, being pursued by even more droids, along with the vicious Anuba. Desperately trying to keep moving in order to make it to the extraction point in time, as the waves of both organic and robotic foes keep increasing. Eventually, an Anuba is able to mortally wound even Peel. Ahsoka rushes over, and he tells her to be calm, and he will not make it out that she must pass on the location of the secret hyperspace lanes directly to the Jedi Order. Whether you were meant to be on this mission or not, you are now the most important part of it. She would bring his body to the rest of the team, and Tarkin is shocked that the girl would be the one to now have this vital information. After a quick ceremony for the Fallen Master, they arrive at the extraction point. In orbit, one of the largest battles of the Clone Wars erupts, with multiple Venators and CIS capital ships engaging each other. The starfighters and transports try to make their way through the clouds of hyenas and vulture droids. Back on the surface, the Warden would personally try to prevent the escape, but is shot down and finished off by Ahsoka, before he is able to chuck Tarkin into the bubbling pools of lava. Thanks, Padwam Tenno. 
Oh, I see you've trained her well. Plo Koon would be commanding the fleet, while Stacey Tin would prove an excellent starfighter escort, leading them through the carnage and back to the capital ships. Tucking away into the Venator's hangar, Plo gives the all clear, and they make the jump back to Coruscant. They mourn the loss of Even Peel, but know that this information could help bring about a quicker end to the war, though Ahsoka and Tarkin have different ideas as to whom this information belongs to. I was instructed by Chancellor Palpatine to bring the intel directly to him for debriefing. I promised Master Peel that I would deliver it only to the Council. And Anakin has one more burning question about this whole operation. Did you assign Ahsoka to the mission? It appears I did. And walks off with little Ahsoka. The next battle would be on Felucia. It is unclear if the CIS invasion had anything to do with the Jedi helping the Nicillan farmers fighting off Hondo's pirate gang, or if the Separatists merely invaded this world on their own initiative. But much like on Meridun, they had set up at least one prefabricated base, which held a sizable army of various droid units. Ahsoka and Skywalker led the charge, deflecting bolts while the ATTE walkers and clone troopers filled through the thick Felucian jungles. Once in position, Plo Koon would set the plan in motion. Native Felucians would act as guides, allowing Skywalker to find the best place to hide his troops. Plo would stay with the tanks, and Ahsoka would lead troops with grapple hooks. You taught me well. I can handle anything. Don't get cocky. As she made her way through the fluorescent jungle, Ahsoka sensed something was watching them, but it wasn't a droid, and she assumes it must be an animal, with this world hosting countless life forms. Once she calms back that they are in position, Plo orders the ATTEs to open fire. When the doors to the base open, dwarf spider droids file out and are ambushed by Anakin's forces. Slicing through them while the 504s blasted them, the door remained open and allowed their team to press through. With the droids now worried about Skywalker's troops rushing in through the front door, Plo and the wolf pack come flying in on jetpacks, while Ahsoka protects the grapple hook troopers as they make their ascent. The plan was executed perfectly and went off without a hitch, but that is except for one major loss. The presence Ahsoka had picked up on was a Trandoshan, who was on Felucia to bring in some exotic and dangerous animals for the big hunt. He ended up in the middle of the battle, but walked away with one of the most deadly creatures in the galaxy, a catch that would make for a thrilling event for these sport hunters. Back in the base, Anakin is growing worried. Ahsoka! You won't be needing this. Waska was the forest moon to Trandosha, and there are several islands that these hunters stock with different types of game. Island 4 seems to have been reserved for the most dangerous game, the sapient life forms. To set the tone, the prisoners are dropped from their cages and onto the beach, where they are rained down on by a rapid fire blaster cannon. Several are killed in these first moments, but Ahsoka is able to make it into the thicket. Still in utter shock and confusion, she is set upon by three beings. We used to be Jedi younglings. Khalifa the human, Jinx the Twi'lek, and Omer the Syrian. Each seem to be about her age, if not older, but tell her that they were kidnapped as Jedi younglings. We were taken by those foul lizards for their amusement. We hunted, killed, and mounted on their wall as trophies. Back on Felucia, we see that the Republic forces have been tirelessly searching throughout the night and into the next morning. Skywalker is short with Rex, telling the troopers that he doesn't care how many times they have to search the same area. They will not leave until they find her. We have alerted our forces throughout the Outer Rim, and intelligence assets inside the confederacy if she is spotted we shall know about it but still anakin was not yielding forcing plo to directly call him out for not having control over his emotions and to order skywalker and his men to leave in the hunter's lodge we see the heads of numerous creatures of all sizes shapes and intelligences the jedi were weaving through an enormous vine-like forest as they set eyes on two other survivors that came in with ahsoka we should help them no. Khalifa's experience told her that the lizards were already zeroing in on these two. Blaster fire erupts, and eventually they are both killed, with the younglings trying to convince Ahsoka that that was just how it works here. There was no room for heroics, and no way to defeat the hunters. They can only stick together and try to survive for as long as possible. But Ahsoka was not having it, saying that her master would be ashamed of her, and that with the Force as a weapon, she could find a way off this hellish world. Heading out into the thicket, she decided to taunt the Trandoshans. Here, lizard, lizard. Find me. With a split second to spare, she senses the eyes on her. Force pulls the rifle aside and slams the hunter down. But when she tried to take him, she is thrown off and he is able to grab his rifle, raising it up, only to be choked by Khalifa. Don't kill him out of hatred. This good deed did not go unpunished. The hunter called out to his brethren, forcing the Padawans to flee. Once they were safe, Khalifa revealed how Ahsoka's bravery inspired them. Your strength, it's what we've been lacking and forgot who we are. We are Jedi. 
They plan to take one of their hunting platforms and search for the lodge. The next morning, they learn why it was so hard to find this base, as it was a massive floating platform. Worse, the speeders had noticed them and flew down to open fire with their miniguns. As a rite of passage, the young Dar would try to go kill Khalifa with his bare hands. You have the honor of being my first Jedi kill. Before he can fire, Ahsoka swoops down and confronts him. The fight is tough, with Dar still keeping up for a while, but when he rushes the Padawan, she uses his greater mass against him and sends him flying over her, impaling himself on the meter-long thorns below. Khalifa was battered, but happy to be back fighting like a Jedi should. Though this moment would not last, as a red bolt came screaming through the jungle and mortally wounded Khalifa. Ahsoka would hold her and duck behind the thicket while the Trandoshan was going mad. Those Jedi whelps killed my son. Though she would not make it off this world, Khalifa is able to embrace her fate with the peace of a true Jedi. I'll take care of the others. I know you will. And she dies with a smile on her face. Back at the temple on Coruscant, Plo Koon sees that Anakin has not stopped searching through each and every report from the GAR and their spies within the CIS, trying to find any clue to where his Padawan might have been taken. But Plo is trying to get Anakin to see the lesson in this. This may not be within your power. Whatever you're trying to say, Master Plo, just say it. If you have trained her well, she shall take care of herself. After nightfall on Waska, Ahsoka is able to meet up with Omel and Jinx. And once they learn that Khalifa is dead, they no longer want to fight, but she is able to rally them. If it's only a matter of time till we die, I say we go down with a fight. When the next shipment comes to the beach, they call on the force and are able to launch themselves onto the ship. The co-pilot comes out to eliminate these rowdy prey, but gets more than he bargained for. Battered by Omel and Jinx while Ahsoka rushes to the pilot, a scattergun nearly cuts her in two, but always nimble and powerful, she is able to best the lizard. During the scuffle, the control panels were damaged, overriding many of the ship's functions, and now causing a twisting and turning of this segmented hull. Explosions erupt and the ship comes plummeting down. Luckily, Ahsoka was able to release the prisoner cages before it crashed. And out of this smoldering rubble emerges a tall, hairy being, a Wookiee who goes by the name of Chewbacca. They bring him back to their base where Ahsoka is able to translate, and the two Padawan are even more frustrated than before, having lost the ship that was supposed to be their ticket off this world. But Chewie says that if he can make it back to the crash site, he could craft a transmitter. His homeworld of Kashyyyk was nearby, and these Trandoshan raids were something his people had to put up with for centuries. Ahsoka and Chewie were able to retrieve the parts, but a hunter was waiting. Sniper rifle zoning in on Ahsoka, only to be detected by her Jedi friends, and forced into the open where Chewie's greater strength allows him to take the hunter prisoner. They don't know if the transmitter was able to get off a message before shorting out, and Jinx says that they need to press their advantage and use this prisoner to try and assault the hunting lodge one more time. Ahsoka, you got us to believe in ourselves again, and, well, I believe Jinx's plan will work. She agrees to help them, but has to convince Chewie to come as well. The Wookiee feeling that luck has not been on his side lately. By using a force mind trick, they get the hunter to call a speeder to pick him up. Once the vessel sets down, they ambush the pilot and easily make off with the craft. Flying up to the platform, the whole lodge is alerted. Some are sent off the edge, others are beaten, while Omel nearly guns a couple of them down. But their leader is able to disable the craft, sending it crashing down toward the Jedi and Wookiee. When they look up, the hunters have them pinned. But just then, a dropship appears. The bounty hunter Sugi was hired by the Wookiees who had received Chewbacca's distress call. They rush out and confront the reptilian adversaries, which is just the latest battle in this timeless feud between these two species. The Wookiees would blast the rest, while Ahsoka entered the lodge to finish Garnak. The toughest among them, he nearly defeated her, but eventually he too would be overwhelmed by her expert wielding of the Force. Surrounded by the skins of those he had killed for sport, he screams that Ahsoka must pay for what she did to his son. And when he reaches for the blaster, she is forced to send him flying through the doors, where he flips over the railing and falls to his death. All I had was your training, and the lessons you taught me. And because of you, I did survive. I was able to lead others to survive as well. Yoda was watching and overheard everything, smiling to himself and thinking that this pairing was working. Ahsoka was turning that reckless power into an ability to inspire and lead others. And perhaps she would indeed help Skywalker overcome his fear of loss. And through Ahsoka, he would realize that there would be times where he could not save the ones he loved. Hopefully, Skywalker would learn to trust the Force and understand that there were problems that even the Chosen One could not solve. Their next mission would take them to Mon Cala, where Skywalker was assigned as Padme's Jedi Protector during the heated debates in the Council Hall. 
King Kalina was mysteriously assassinated, and though his son, Prince Lichar, was set to take over, the Quarren think he is too young, and demanded to have more of a say in the government. Rift Hamson was a CIS ambassador, and in the ear of many powerful Quarren, hoping to use this turmoil to put them towards secession, while Anakin and Padme would represent the Republic's interest in mediating this transition. The Jedi Council feels that Tamsin's presence here was a good sign that the CIS may be planning to initiate a civil war, and respond by dispatching a company of scuba troopers led by Kit Fisto and Ahsoka. Akbar is tasked with organizing the Mon Calamari military and acting as the personal bodyguard to Prince Lichar. Tensions are high on Mon Calamari as Akbar convenes with Prince Lichar. They hope for the best, but moments later, their worst fears are confirmed and a full-blown underwater civil war erupts. Rift Tamsin would attack the capital with hundreds of aqua droids, along with Quarren separatists. Above the surface, the Republic was ready. A Venator and Atmosphere would coordinate with a Charger C-70 and numerous LA-80 gunships. The scuba troopers drop into the water and make a quick descent with their jet-propelled suits and submersible devilfish vehicles. Huge sections of the capital were being destroyed, and the Quarren fighters were able to rip Anakin's helmet off, but Ahsoka was there to save her master's life. Again. And it under control, Snips. <laughs> I knew you'd say that. While Anakin rushes over to save the Senator, he orders his Padawan to protect the Prince. Riff Tamsin was about to rip him apart in his shark-like jaws, but at the last second, Ahsoka's green blade strikes at his face and he is repelled. Hitching a ride on her submersible, they are able to make it into an express tube. They're suddenly cut off by aqua droids, with Tamsin smashing his head into the glass. He broke through and might have devoured them if the Calamari Guard did not show up and open fire with their blaster spears. The Republic chalked this up as a victory, but knew the Separatists would launch a counterattack. Also lurking above the surface, opposite to the Jedi fleet, were several Trident-class assault ships, Providence, and two C-9979 landing crafts which drop down these odd hemispheres. Once they start sinking, they come to life, emitting a yellow glow and extending their enormous tentacles. These were a new CIS prototype for conquering water worlds. They were cyborg creatures, jellyfish that were covered with armor plating that made it impervious to blasters and even lightsabers. While an augmented power supply gave their electrical attacks even more power, Kit Fisto discovered a weakness, sending a devil fish to crash into the core of the hydroid Medusa, sparking a chain reaction with that power supply that would blow them apart. The Republican Calamari troops were forced to retreat to the Coral Caves, where the young prince laments his shortcomings as a leader, and thanks Ahsoka for saving him. Akbar tells him that his late father would be proud, and that they will continue the fight the next day. But Anakin convinces them that they must try to make it to the surface and take refuge in the Republic ships before they are hunted down. To get up quickly, Fisto went about stealing the Quarren scout vehicles. You're up first. Take the Prince and Senator Tills. Got it. And just as they were about to make it up, the C-70 exploded. Riff had anticipated this move and sent droids to capture it and set up charges. Scattered and without an escape, they again have to hide while the Separatists have free reign over the city. Meanwhile on Naboo, we see that the Jedi Council is asking the Gungans, another underwater dwelling species, to mobilize their army and come to the aid of their beloved Senator Padme. While the Gungan Council says they need more time, Jar Jar is able to rally them. In the underwater vegetation, the Calamari watch as the Quarren and droids move enormous groups of captured civilians. Fisto saying that they will be used as slave labor to help the CIS war machine. Lichar is devastated, still thinking himself a coward, but Ahsoka has wise words for him. You don't have to carry a sword to be powerful. Some leader's strength is inspiring greatness in others. Akbar tells Anakin that if they could take out the communication center, the Separatists would be blind to any incoming Republic reinforcements. While Anakin's troops try to take out some of the patrols in the capital, they are descended upon by the Hydroid Medusa, but at least this took them away from the prisoners, giving Lee Char the chance to give an inspiring speech to his people. And just then, the Gungans come raining in, quickly making their descent and helping to free both the prisoners and join up with Anakin to try and figure out a way to take out the cyborg jellyfish. Ahsoka's forces would be personally attacked by Rift Tamsin, who would use the larger Trident class to create a massive whirlpool. The Shark General would zip through the turbulence and try to tear the Prince apart, but Ahsoka was able to keep him at bay. Anakin would race over and destroy the ship, but nearly all of the Republic and Calamari forces were surrounded and captured all but Lee, Char, and Ahsoka, who were able to slip away through the kelp-covered cave systems, and seeming to have lost it all, the prince can't understand how Ahsoka can stay so calm and optimistic. Aren't you scared? I used to be. All the time. If you make decisions out of fear, you're more likely to be wrong. In his newly captured capital, Riff is furious that this main target escaped, torturing his captives with more of these aquatic cyborg creatures. 
Nasir Rai was the Quran senator, and though he was allied with Rif, the prince knows that this is only because Nasir felt that it was best for his Quran people. If Lee Char could convince him that Dooku simply wanted to take the planet for himself, and cast both of these native people aside, then these two species could reunite. Fortunately, Dooku was playing his hand a bit too aggressively, allowing Rift to move in legions of his Karkaradon soldiers, making Nosir suspicious that they wanted to make this their new watery home. After sneaking into a prison camp, the Prince and Ahsoka meet up with their senator and Captain Akbar, who is shocked to learn that Lee Char is going to rely on a Korin traitor. When the Aqua Droids detect them, the Prince demands a meeting in the throne room. Drunk off his apparent victory, Tamsin reveals how he played the foolish Korin. The Quarren are more gutless than your people. Once in the royal chamber, Lee Char pleads with Nosirai, stressing how the shark turned their people against each other, depleting their ranks of soldiers so that once the Calamari were defeated, the Quarren could be easily turned into slaves. Nasir can see it as true, but is still too afraid to act. To send a message to everyone, Riff orders a public execution of the prince, to be ripped apart by a trio of Karkaradons. It's all part of the plan, master. I was hoping you were gonna say that. Anything I can do? Unfortunately, this time, it's out of our hands. The Quarren leader could not watch the son of his friend killed. He shoots over while releasing a cloud of ink. In the confusion, he orders his people to fight for Lee Char. Combined Republic, Gungan, Calamari, and Quarren forces rise up and engage the countless droids and shark soldiers, the unique weaponry of each making for an incredible display of underwater carnage, with Calamari spears, Gungan electro whips, and Tamsin's exploding knives one of which the prince was able to remove and plunge into the shark that killed his father, turning the CIS commander into chum. When the fighting came to an end, an assembly was held with these now reunited peoples, and Nosirai crowned Lee Char as the new king, Ahsoka witnessing how powerful this once fearful young leader had become, with the help of a little Jedi wisdom, of course. The next battle would be one of the most intense of the entire Clone Wars, but Ahsoka did not play a major role. During the Battle of Umbara, she and Barriss Afi fought in the space battle portion that blew away the large blockade, but did not partake in the ground invasion. And though she likely wished to be a part of that campaign, the next fight would be personal. Yoda tells them that they had lost contact with a large Togruta colony on the planet Kiros in the expansion region. Dooku personally led the invasion force comprised of hundreds of B-1 battle droids. The defenseless colony was taken instantly, and when the Republic forces came to investigate, Ahsoka notes that the village was far too quiet. Zipping to the capital via their BARC speeders, they are ambushed by commando droids on flint knots. A full-out biker battle ensues, with Ahsoka standing up in the sidecar deflecting bolts away, then manning the gun to blast away the clankers, and even showing off some amazing athleticism while taking out an AAT. Once they get to the capital, Kenobi is informed that the CIS commander wishes to speak with him, but when they see the hologram of Darth Sinar, Anakin loses it. Zygerian scum! Ahsoka is confused by this reaction, and when Skywalker steps away, Kenobi explains this hatred for the slavers. Anakin has never talked about his past, has he? Only to tell me he won't talk about it. They have known each other for two years now, and yet Anakin has not told Ahsoka even the most general summary of his past. She didn't know her own master grew up as a slave, but she and Kenobi did know how to handle Anakin when his rage was bubbling. Don't worry, I'll keep an eye on him. Yes, make sure you do. Zygerian reveals to Kenobi that he was not going to surrender, but wanted to show the Jedi that he had placed bombs all over the settlement. With an inconspicuous activation of his comm, Anakin and Ahsoka heard the whole conversation, and raced through the streets on their ATRTs. Seeing the large explosion device, Ahsoka is cautious in removing the panel and trying to see how to deactivate it, but Anakin has a simple solution, hoping a quick swing of his saber would do the trick. How did you know that would work? I trusted my instincts. Onto the next set of bombs, they see these are linked and must be destroyed at the same time, while B2s and sniper droidicas appear to rain down blaster fire. This is a test of their ability to work together in harmony, first needing to have the snipers look at them, and then bounce the incoming bolt into the opposite droidica, then slashing through the explosives at the exact same moment. Obi-Wan was stalling, but as soon as he heard the bombs were disabled, he pulls his lightsaber back and demands a surrender. Sigurian had a backup plan though activating the bomb strapped to his tactical droid and hurling him at Obi-Wan before making his escape. The Jedi were in hot pursuit, and with this great jumping ability of the frog walkers, and a little boost from the Force, the Jedi were able to make it onto the YV-865, where we see just how Anakin's blind rage to kill this slaver actually led him here without a plan. So, what's your plan? 
I'm open to ideas. When the loading door opened, the Jedi were greeted by a monstrous tentacled creature. As Anakin was fighting with it, Ahsoka made it to the cockpit. Lightsabers pinning the slaver, she was able to deliver the scum to her master. Skywalker would try to get him to reveal the location of the Togruta prisoners, and when he resists, the ex-slave boy violently presses his saber to Dinar's neck. Ahsoka is taken aback by his actions having had her own history of rough interrogations in the past, but she could feel how deep this hatred was. It does work, however, and he reveals that their queen will be hosting a great slave auction. Even after this, he insults the Jedi as being weak and near their end. Although Ahsoka enjoys her master's tough talk in support of the Order, and promising to rescue the slaves, you can see in her face that she is still disturbed by this dark side of her master. With the report to the Council, they confirm that all of the Togruta from this settlement have gone missing. Vanished? That's impossible. Those are my people. With this stolen ship, they could make it to the slaver homeworld of Zygeria, donning their traditional garb. Rex and Kenobi would explore the city, while Skywalker would act as Ahsoka's slave master, in order to help them gain access to the royal court. In the presence of the Queen, we see that Ahsoka is not accustomed to being subservient to others. Notice the pat from Anakin, as his Padawan could never conceive of herself as being one of the lower beings, bowing before her majesty. When the Queen comes closer to inspect her, Ahsoka snaps. Don't you dare touch me. But the queen is impressed with Anakin's made-up backstory and persona, and even takes a romantic interest in him. Meanwhile, by the open-air holding cells, Kenobi and Rex spot a single Togruta. Terrified by his Zygerian armor at first, he is too weak to speak. They try to get him out by commandeering one of the flying lizards known as Brezax, but are shot off of its back. Rex was able to hold on to the reins and make it away, but would eventually be caught as well. At the palace, Soka witnesses one of the slaves driven mad and leaping to her death. This was a side of the universe that was new to her, giving her a glimpse into the source of her master's anger. Later that day, an auction was held, with some samples being brought before the crowd. The auctioneer bragging that they had captured 50,000 Togruta from the pacifist settlement. That these people refused to ever commit an act of violence, and thus their future owner would have no fears of a slave revolt. And then their Jedi prisoner was brought out. The Queen states the Jedi are so ignorant that they don't see the bonds they wear. For they have forsaken their ideals to serve a corrupt senate. Every Jedi has become a slave to the Republic. Anakin was tasked with whipping this prisoner in front of the crowd, but the Jedi decide to put on a show of their own. Attacking the slavers, R2 shoots out a blade to Ahsoka, and she is able to take out the guards and capture the queen. But slavers, like bounty hunters, always have some tricky tech up their sleeves. Her throne controls a shock collar on Ahsoka, and with a massive jolt she is knocked unconscious, to be taken into a cage that hangs off the side of the ziggurat-like palace. Shockingly, the queen was still attracted to Anakin. In order to keep him by her side, she used the threat of executing Rex and Kenobi, who had been sent to the slave work camp on Kadavo. The queen's fantasy of enchanting Anakin and reinstating the slave empire are brought to an abrupt halt when Count Dooku arrives. He understands that this opportunity cannot be wasted, with Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka captured, that they should be immediately executed. The Queen tried to get him behind their vision of reducing the Jedi Order to slaves, but Dooku insists they must be killed. As they debate, Skywalker had snuck out to free Ahsoka, and she would rush to their stolen ship, while Anakin is summoned to the throne room. Enamored by Anakin, and outraged that Dooku would command her in her own palace, the Queen refused to execute this Jedi, and the Count is forced to make her understand her place in the CIS. Punishment for a slave who disobeys her master. Fighting with only a light whip, Skywalker is able to keep Dooku off and position himself to grab the Queen and jump to Ahsoka in their stolen slave ship. Betrayed and mortally wounded, she reveals to Anakin where his friends were being held. Inside the facility, we see that Dooku had ordered the Keeper to execute Kenobi and Rex. And with reports that an unexpected ship has arrived, he knows it must be Skywalker. The enormous turbo laser emplacements reduce the ship to slag, but the Jedi were already working their way through the camp. Obi-Wan informs him that they cannot win this fight alone, and that the slavers will kill the Togruta if he does not surrender. Seconds later, a Venator erupts out of hyperspace, with Plo Koon and the Wolf Pack rushing in on Z-95 headhunters and LAAT gunships. Perimeter defenses were picked apart, while guards inside scramble to lock everything down. Keeper Argus opening the floor in the containment cell and electrifying the walls. While Kenobi fought for control of the camp systems, Ahsoka would rush to the Togruta. Her creative solution was to have the Arquidans pull up just under the open cell, and with the jetpack troopers and grapple lines, they were able to safely evac the Togruta. Ahsoka, you have done a great deed for your people today. Then the first ever negotiations between the Republic and Separatists were being held on the neutral world of Mandalore. 
This assembly is held in the throne room of Duchess Satine, but Ahsoka notices one member that catches her attention. You didn't mention that Lux Bonteri would be here. The room is hushed as he is the first speaker, with all expecting him to make a case for the secessionists. What the boy does reveal shocks everyone. It has come to my attention that my mother was murdered by Count Dooku in cold blood! The Separatist members usher him away, and Padme and Ahsoka know that this public declaration against the Count is a death sentence. We can't just let them take him! He'll be killed! Ahsoka follows the guards out to a Separatist ship, where she overhears the Count confessing to Mina's murder, before giving out the order to execute Lux. Just after the message ends, Ahsoka rushes into the room and blasts the droids. When they pull away, she contacts Anakin and says that they will be coming to Coruscant. You will be safe now with the Republic. Lux plays along, but when the conversation is over, he whips out a blaster, telling Ahsoka that he has a plan. He will not be joining the Republic either. Instead, he will be meeting with allies he had made on Karnak, others who seek the death of Count Dooku. Though she stripped the gun away, he had a backup stunner, incapacitating her for quite a while. She would regain conscious on world and realize she no longer had her lightsabers. When she rushes out to confront him, she meets his new friends. Death Watch. They lie that they are betrothed, and Bo Katan starts inspecting her. R2 reveals that he had the sabers, but for now the fighting would wait. Arriving at the camp, R2 is horrified seeing how these Mandalorians had fun with their droid prisoners, shooting them just to watch their reactions. They're escorted into a tent where Pre Vizsla shows Lux a scar on his face that Dooku gave him and says that he can trust their interests are aligned. With the exchange of information on the Count, the Mandalorians and Bon Terry spend the night celebrating, while Ahsoka is thrown in with a tent of captives, and they're all ordered to prepare meals for the warriors. Careful not to choke on your stupidity. The local chief barges in to demand the release of the women, to which Vizsla surprisingly agrees. The following morning, the exchange was made, but it was too good to be true, as the chief's daughter was back in her arms. The dark saber is ignited and takes her life. Jetpacks engage, the Mandos fly to the rooftops and unleash their flamethrowers upon the entire village. People burn up inside their homes, while Ahsoka and Lux are forced to watch. But a dying wish could not be ignored. Save them, Ahsoka. Save them. Save my people. This was too much, and using a pole from the debris, Ahsoka was able to spear one and take out a few more Mandos. Though four fiber cord whips were enough to bring this Jedi down. All this time, R2 was making friends with the other droids, repairing them, and in some cases, even getting their weapon systems operational. The astromech knew that Ahsoka was in danger, and leads his new crew to Vizsla's tent. Inside, we hear just how much Vizsla hated the Jedi. Centuries earlier, the Jedi had destroyed Mandalore, the war reducing their once lush world to the barren terrain with the domed cities we see today. For their crimes against Mandalore. So you see, it's not murder at all. It's like you say. It's justice! But R2 is right on time, smoke screening the room and getting the sabers to Ahsoka, and she gives us one of the most amazingly smooth combat maneuvers in the entire Clone Wars, seamlessly executing four Death Watch Mandos while backflipping out of the restraints. The fight would spill out of the tent, where Death Watch was greeted with the droid revolt, smashing and blasting their way through the Mandos, while Vizsla engaged Ahsoka in single combat. Dual blades versus the dark saber and wrist blaster. The fight was quick, as she realized that his guard was excellent but her athleticism allowed her to flip over him and strike his jetpack, separating the two as they ran from the explosion. Lux and R2 had grabbed a speeder and were racing back to the ship, but were descended upon by Bo-Katan and two other Mandos. One would be taken out by a deflected bowl, while R2 sprayed the other with oil, giving Ahsoka the chance to cast him away, but would engage her before the Padawan could reach for her blades, with the Mando martial arts being one of the best in the galaxy. But the Force was a powerful ally, launching Bo-Katan away and allowing them to reach the transport. Safely in space, they would head back to Coruscant, though R2 notes that an escape craft had been activated. Ahsoka was surprised at just how hard a goodbye this would be. They got into this mess with the Mandos because of this horrible plan, but she was the one who worried about him and came to his rescue back on Mandalore. But, but we can try. Uh, try to change things together. Don't worry, we'll meet again. As he pulls off, she double takes to get another look at this boy with whom she was developing a very complicated relationship. From here, Ahsoka would meet back with Anakin, and after completing another mission, her master wanted to stop off at a diner, simply to get a break from the GAR rations. But moments before, Savage Press had rampaged through here in search for his lost brother, Darth Maul. The Jedi rushed to help, but the owner and police droids say stuff like this was normal out here. Being treated to a free meal, Ahsoka notices how disturbed her master is when he gets hit with the impression of Savage and the Force. Disturbance? Something sinister. 
Do you know what or who it is? These phantoms of the dark side would haunt Ahsoka for years to come, being tied to Maul's fate far beyond the Clone Wars itself, and events that we will cover in the next part of this series. Seeing Ahsoka's challenges with the Jedi Order, decisions that would push her master toward the dark side, as the Dark Lord of the Sith took control of the galaxy, defining the focus and purpose of the rest of Ahsoka's life. Subscribe so you don't miss anything. Please hit that like button, it's the best way to help me out. Check out the other Complete Life videos here, but most important of all, remember, if your enemy's a Jedi, you really need to kill them, not just detain them. And the Force will be with you. Always.